frankly, Google don't need any more money than they already have, in my opinion. So you want to make the money you do spend with them go as far as possible. This is Super Fast Business with James Schramko. James Schramko. Helping you build your business super fast. 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 James Schramko here. Welcome back to superfastbusiness.com. Today, we are talking Google AdWords. In particular, we're going to be talking about the 10 classic mistakes that people make when they're doing AdWords. So if you're doing AdWords or you're thinking about doing AdWords, you absolutely must tune into this episode because you are going to save a fortune in the Google tax. And today, I have brought an expert along because I'm no longer an expert on this subject. Welcome to this episode, Ilana Wexler. Thank you, James. It's awesome to be here. Thank you for coming over here. You are normally found at greenarrowdigital.com. You are an expert in paid advertising. In particular, you've been doing quite a lot of work with Google AdWords, and I hear you also do some Facebook stuff. It's true. Yeah. I, um, I'm a specialist in paid traffic, and obviously AdWords and Facebook are very much my bread and butter Right. And I've been referring clients to you because they've been getting great results. And as part of my coaching group at Silver Circle there, I get to work closely with you and I see what you're doing and I like what you're doing for the clients. So I've said, hey, we should talk about this stuff on an episode and here we are. So let's just get into the mind of our potential trainee here. Someone who's got an AdWords account possibly running some campaigns or about to embark on the the difficult trial of setting it up and it's not that hard from the google perspective you're putting in your payment method and start a campaign but there are quite a lot of options for you to choose and many wrong turns you could take that are going to cost you big time so what we're going to be looking at in this episode is what sort of things do you expect to find When you're logging into someone's Google AdWords account, what do you already know they're going to have made a mistake with? And importantly, what can we do to fix that? So then we're going to to cover a few of these, up to 10, I think. So let's start with the, the number one top mistake that people are making with their AdWords campaign. All right. So I have the privilege of getting access to hundreds of AdWords accounts and the classic mistake I see everyone make is they don't have structure in their account. And what I mean by that is they just have one campaign, one ad group and literally hundreds of keywords in that one ad group. And it's a classic mistake because there's no relevance for the keyword to match the ad. So you have to structure your account properly such that they're all separated into appropriate keyword themes. Right. So this is along the lines of segmentation. Exactly. That's right. And the same applies to AdWords. So in in business, it's very hard to have a one-size-fits-all solution. In your AdWords account, if you are trying a one-size-fits-all advertising approach, then you're probably being not that relevant to most of the people that are seeing your ad. So therefore you're overpaying. Is that right? 100%. You're massively overpaying. You get really bad click-through rates because your ads just aren't relevant to what what they're meant to be saying. And it's you end up paying a lot more because your quality score is terrible and it just kind of all just goes downhill from there. So the fix is we need to structure our account into more granular detail. Is that right? Exactly. So there's, as you sort of touched on, there's many default settings that Google lay that are sort of designed to sort of make it easy for you to create an account, but they're actually not designed in your best interest, which I think is actually quite unfair of them. And one of them is grouping together a search campaign with a display uh, campaign together so that search and display are together when really they need to be separated out into two completely separate campaigns because the behavior of those campaigns is completely different and by having them together the data that you get from that campaign is completely worthless because the click-through rates are completely different, the the amount of impressions you get is completely different. So 
you need to, as I said, separate the search and display campaigns to be separate. But you also need to create keyword themes within just a search campaign as well as your display campaigns. So there's sort of multi-levels of of the granular aspect to it. Excellent. So your account's going to be into lots of little tightly segmented groups so that you have um, a minimal amount of keywords, a hyper-relevant ad for that keyword, and that you are now rifle sniping instead of using a shotgun. Exactly. And then by structuring it that way, you can create really, really specific ads that are relevant to that particular keyword because an ad is tied to an ad group. So um, by separating them out, you know that your ad is laser targeted to that particular keyword and is really relevant to that person. You'll find an infinitely better click-through rate and conversion rate. Perfect. All right, well, let's talk about classic AdWords mistake number two. Number two, no conversion tracking. So (gasps) I know, and I can't tell you how many times I see it time and time again where there's no form of knowing what's working and what's not. So you sort of, you've got no idea as to, you know, your phone's ringing, things are going well, but you've got no idea which keywords are driving those conversions. You've got no idea which ads are working. So in our agency, we implement at least three different types of conversion tracking. Number one being like, obviously, someone submits a form online. So they have a thank you page and that conversion tracking pixel is fired when they land on that thank you page. Number two is the calls directly from the ads. So someone who hasn't even gone to your website at all, they're on their mobile device, they've done a Google search, they've seen the ad, they've clicked call and they've just gone straight to calling you. And that's a different conversion because it's a different kind of behavior. And number three is a call from your website. So this is a little bit different where they're, let's say, at home, they're doing a Google search on their desktop, they click on an ad, they go to your website, they go, yep, I'm interested. They see the phone number, but then they change device and they pick up the phone and call you. So effectively with that change of device, you would have normally lost the ability to track them, but you can set it up such a way with Google call tracking, which is a free service, where that phone number is changed and it's a dedicated AdWords number so that they call that AdWords number, but it's swapped at the switch. I don't know how they, I don't know how Google do it. And they end up calling you, but the important thing is that you get the data as to it's tracked back into your AdWords account. So you know which keyword triggered that particular phone call and you know which ad they clicked on, et cetera, et cetera. So you get all the benefits of the knowledge. Perfect. So in other words, you shouldn't run an ad unless you can tell if it's a winner or a loser. And the way you do that is to install conversion tracking. Of course, if some of the terms that Alana's using here are beyond your current awareness, that's okay. That's a good reason to be listening to this episode. You can look it up, conversion tracking, pixels, etc. You'll need someone to install this on your website or uh, at least get the pixel from your account and it's going to be a minor amount of tech. Once you overcome that hurdle, you usually only have to do this once. And once you've done that, it'll automatically start tracking which ones of your campaigns are working. It allows you to turn off the losing campaigns so that your winning campaigns can be scaled up, your losing campaigns can be stopped and you'll stop paying for ads that are not doing anything for you. Is that right? Exactly. It's kind of like a reallocation of budget. So you're taking money away from campaigns that are losing money and aren't working and pouring that money into the campaigns that are working. So you're spending more on what is working, but equally important, less on what's not working. Exactly. Okay. That was a good tip. Uh, It's absolutely fundamental. Fundamental. Yeah. For anyone who's got a serious marketing budget so that you can scale up the winners. All right, mistake number three, classic AdWords mistake. Number three is that they're running ads but they haven't set up remarketing or um, or installed the remarketing code on their website even if they're not doing remarketing. Okay, let's first just uh, explain what is remarketing. Remarketing is showing ads to people who've been to your website before. Perfect. So it's, I mean, we've covered this many years ago. I've had other discussions about remarketing you can look them up on superfast 
www.thebusiness.com in the search box. We'll also link to some in the show notes if you want to get deeper into it. What Alana is saying here is that you're missing a huge opportunity if you're not putting that code on your site because you might want to be able to get in touch with people who visited areas of your website but didn't take the next step. I imagine a checkout page is a pretty good place to be putting a remarketing code. Well, ideally you want it site-wide, which is on every single page of your website because as we both know, you know, um, 98% of the people who come to your website don't do what you really want them to do. So remarketing is a great way just to get a second bite of the cherry because it's laser targeted because they've been to your website before, they know you already. So, but, so the classic mistake is, you know, they're running ads, but if you don't install the pixel, you can't have that second bite of the cherry because it's sort of similar to Google Analytics code that it needs to be installed to be recording who's been to your website before. So ideally, I say to people, even before they start running ads, let's get that remarketing pixel on your site now so that if and when we do want to start remarketing, we've got a huge list of people who've been to your site before that we can just straight away start showing really targeted ads to. Right, so it's an invisible database that you can just turn on at will and it's highly targeted. Exactly, yes. And there's cool stuff you can do with with specific remarketing for certain segments who you know are more likely to respond. Uh, For example, the checkout segment. Yeah, exactly. And that kind of leads into another one of the mistakes which we can cover now. (laughs) Oh, let's go. Mistake number four. Yep, is so if we... Continuing on the remarketing um, example is that you need to create separate lists of people. So let's say you have your master. So the maximum allowable time Google will remember who's been to your website is 540 days. So you've got your master list, but then what you need to do is you need to create sub lists from that master list based on certain criteria. And that criteria can be time since they've last visited your site as well as pages that they've visited your site. So you might have a list of people who've been to your website in the last 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, etc., as well as additional lists of people who have visited certain pages as you touched on your shopping cart page or they've been to the view the cart but they haven't completed the purchase. So you need to step that out granularly as well so that you can see create campaigns based on that behavior right and also you can do other segments can't you like how long they spent on the website exactly so that is through incorporating google analytics remarketing so you need to link your google analytics account to your adwords account and then from there within your google analytics account you can create remarketing lists based on behavior so, for example, you might say, analyze your Google Analytics account and say, yeah, people who spend more than two minutes on my site have a much higher conversion rate. I only want to remarket to those people because they convert better. They're worth spending money on, for example. Or people who have an iPhone convert better than people who are Android. I mean, you can be as granular as you like. Right. And I imagine after seeing so many accounts, you've got a pretty good idea what type of remarketing segments you're going to go for when, when yep. it, like to shoot the fish in the barrel? Exactly, yeah. So at least we start with the, the classic kind of winners and then from there we can expand out or not. Obviously, it's dependent on, on budget of the clients. Of course. Now, uh, it's worth mentioning at this point, if you think you want help with this, then you can go and visit Elana's site at greenarrowdigital.com where she can actually uh, find out if you're the right type of customer that she normally would help. And you can find out if she's got the right service for you. And she might be able to help you do this if you pay her and ask her nicely. Uh, On the the other side of it, if you want to learn how to do this yourself at a high level, I know that from time to time, Alana is running masterclasses. She has a page at greenarrowdigital.com forward slash masterclass. You could head over there and invest a little bit in your education and have Ilana teach you what she knows over a series of weeks so that within a short period, you would have a master level of AdWords. So let's get back into the 10 classic AdWords mistakes and we're up to mistake number five. 
Okay, so let's continue on with the remarketing topic because it's another classic mistake that people make and is that they just set up a remarketing campaign but they don't apply any restrictions. So one of, I really feel, a sneaky um, default setting for Google is that what you'll find is when you analyze where those remarketing ads are being shown, you'll see that they're on literally thousands of these mobile apps. So I don't know people out there, if they've got kids, I know my kids play on the iPad and there's all these in-app ads that sort of pop up and my kids inadvertently click on them and they're completely unintentional. So you can put in a negative placement in your remarketing campaign that will prevent your ads from showing up on all these really silly mobile apps. So some people think, oh, well, I can just turn off mobile, but then it's the whole iPad usage as well. So the URL you need to put in is adsenseformobileapps.com and you put that in as a negative placement and you will save a lot, a lot of money. I recently had a look at an account who had was a really long-standing account I uh, was managed by people and they hadn't done this. And I calculated over the lifetime of the account how much they had spent on just these mobile apps and it was $5,000 approximately. I mean, it's crazy. So it's just this you've got to put this placement in and you just will save a lot of money. Right. So this is another one of those ones where we're taking out the waste. We sort of covered that with a few other ones. Like if, if we go back, structure is about being more relevant Conversion tracking is removing the ones that don't convert at all, cutting the waste. The remarketing code is giving you a byproduct that you can leverage up your existing campaigns. Your sub lists is all about relevance and hyper relevance marketing. And this one is the first specific negative one. It's saying, hey, we don't want our ad showing in this particular place because it's a waste. Have you ever found a customer where those type of ads are effective? I haven't, to be honest. I mean, I'm sure there's probably some out there and maybe you'd want to be a little bit more targeted about which particular type of mobile app placements you'd want to be on rather than being on all of them because there are literally thousands. So I'd want to be targeted about which ones I want to be on. I imagine you'd have to have a pretty general offer for it to be effective, yeah. like those weight loss ones or, you know, like that applies to most of the population. Mm, yeah. Okay, great tip. What about mistake number six? Number six is no negative keywords. I see it time and time again. That Now, we've got to explain what this means. I know what it means and it's important. Okay. It is. So, as we sort of touched on before with the whole structure is um, on conversion tracking, spending more on what is working and, and removing the waste. So, negative keywords are keywords that you tell Google, I don't want to show up for these time, types of of keyword terms. So it's inconceivable to think of every possible keyword you want to show for. So you can set up the keywords such that you can give Google a little bit of rope to go, yep, these are the kinds of keywords I want. Go out and find me people like this. But you add negative keywords in conjunction with that to restrict them from going a little bit crazy. So a classic example is let's say you're a lawyer and you're sort of targeting your services, but you don't want people who are looking for lawyer jobs. So a classic negative keyword there would be jobs. So right. you are restricting Google from kind of showing your ads where they're not relevant. And I think another one from memory might be that certain paid solutions you're offering, you might want to restrict the word free. Free, exactly. Or school project. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or um, a, a university course or, right. or any, you know. So if you know what people might be searching for and your ad will show for but they're not your prospect you want to try and eliminate them through That's right. saying hey we don't want this to show i don't want to spend any money on people who meet this criteria yes so one of the processes that you need to do with ongoing management is to look at the search query report which is a very slight distinction for the keywords. So a lot of people think that they only that they when they type in the keywords that they're bidding on that that's what someone actually typed in. That's not. The search query report tells you what somebody actually typed in. So you need to analyze that report to give you ideas of what are additional keywords to add but also negative keywords to continually add because as I said it's inconceivable to think of every possible negative keyword. 
So by monitoring that search query report, you'll go, oh, okay, I'm showing up for this. I don't want to show up for this anymore. That's not right. This is right. So you're constantly tightening the ratchet, I guess, on on doing more and more and more of what's working and less of what's not working. Right. So it's campaign optimization. So if you're a software company, you might see that people are searching for your software and torrent or crack. Exactly. And you might want to exclude those people because you think they may not have commercial intent. 100%. And that's, you know, once you've installed the conversion tracking, you will be able to see which search queries have actually led that person to contact you and which search queries have not. So over time, you'll get an idea of what are the converting keywords and what are the ones that are wasting heaps of money. Perfect. Well, let's move on to classic AdWords mistake number seven. Number seven is that they only have broad match keywords in their account. And what I mean by that is there are many different match types that you can have in your account. So, and that's kind of, if you think about it, like, how much autonomy you want to give Google. So let's say you know exactly the keywords that you want to show for and only those keywords, you would put in your account what's called the exact match version. So that would be like red BMX bike mail or something like that. That's right, exactly. And you only will show up for the instant when somebody types in that exactly. Nothing before, nothing after, no plural, nothing, just only that phrase. But let's say maybe that term there's not a lot of search queries and what people type in actually amazes me so you kind of want to give (laughs) google a little bit of rope so the next sort of layer of the onion out is what's called the phrase match where you might want that phrase but you say well i don't mind someone having something before it or after it because there's many permutations to search queries so that might be kids bmx bike exactly and the next layer of our, out is what's called modified broad, which means those particular words have to be there, but they can be in any particular order. Right. So someone could have BMX bike kids or BMX kids bike. Exactly. Yep. That's right. And the last one, which sort of gives Google the most amount of autonomy, is what's called broad match. And you will show up for blue BMX motorbike. Or I don't know, I'm making that up. But you know what I mean? <laughs> Not that it exists. But <laughs> Right. So if someone types blue, a blue lake, blue lake picture, they might pull up your blue BMX kids ad. Yeah, like it's useless. So I personally very rarely use broad match, only in very rare instances. But if I do, I have a ton of negative keywords that are tied to that broad match keyword. So you might do it to, when you're starting out on a bit of a discovery mission if you're not super sure of your market, if you haven't got any SEO analytics or conversion data. Exactly. You might start off a bit broad, but you'll very quickly want to stick in your negative keywords, turn off the losing ads because of your conversion tracking, and then split out the winning structure into their own little specific exact groups. That's right. So people have the broad match keywords, as I said, with no negative keywords, and they're showing up for all sorts of completely irrelevant Yeah, search queries and spend a lot of money because obviously, as we all know, AdWords is an auction and some keywords are really expensive. And if you're showing up for them, you are exposing yourself to the opportunity of spending a lot on a keyword that you don't even want. Now, just explain that. AdWords is an auction. Okay. So effectively, as I said, it's an auction whereby people are bidding on a particular keyword. So some keywords, nobody is interested in bidding on it's not really worth very much to them so for example many hobbies or or something like that aren't really competitive keyword terms versus a keyword which people it's worth a lot to someone so for example lawyer sydney where obviously legal services um there's a high return on investment for the lawyers and therefore that's a that's a very classic kind of expensive keyword where there's lots of people bidding on it so because it's a, there's a small amount of practitioners and there's such a high value for jobs. Exactly. High value and, and legal work as well. Yeah, like it's high value jobs and, and you can, you know, the stakes are high. Exactly. Yep. Right. So that is, that's the broad match mistake. Broad only. Let's talk about mistake number eight. The mistake number eight is that they have no ad extensions in their ads. So ad extensions are enhancements to your 
search ads. So normally people know that um, search ads have got the headline and you've got the two lines of text and then your URL, but ad extensions are as they sound, extensions to that ad. And you can have lots of different types of ad extensions, be it site links, which are additional links to a different page on your site. You can have call out, you can have call extensions, you can have location extensions. And so if you utilize all the available ad extensions in your arsenal, you can have up to six lines in an ad pretty much, which is, you know, where real estate, Google real estate is prime real estate that, you know, you can take up a lot of real estate. So it's like you've got the ability to have extra signposts on your ad and, and some people aren't using them all. Yes, and it's important as well because it is ad extensions are actually part of what's called the ad rank formula, which is Google's ranking mechanism of who they decide gets the number one spot or the number two spot. And that kind of like leads me to the next thing where people – when I sort of talk about quality score and some people might be familiar with the term quality score and it's basically Google's sort of metric of analysing how good a keyword is in an account. So it's it's a number from 1 to 10 yep. that Google ass- assigns, as I said, at a keyword level and it's if you have a, re- a high quality score, it basically means you will pay the lowest amount possible. So a misconception is that an ad in the number one spot is paying the highest amount versus number two or number three. And that's actually wrong because they might have a really good quality score, which means that they might be actually paying less than the person in the number two spot. Right. So you want to get your ad extensions fully done? Yes, because it is, as I said, part of the ad rank formula, which a a very large component of that is quality score, which is a very important metric in your account, which is by having no negative keywords and broad match keywords that really affects the quality score of your keywords. So you end up paying more and more and more. Right. Cool. So get your ad extensions fully embellished. Yes. Mistake number nine. Is people only test one ad at a time. So they're only, they don't run two ads together at the same time. So they're not split testing ads. Right. So we should talk here about A, B, split testing. Exactly. So AdWords is the ultimate testing ground in my view where you can run two ads with completely different messaging and you can see the performance of them. Performance, I mean, by the click-through rate and the conversion rate. So your 50% of the time, one ad will be shown and 50% of time, the other ad will be shown. But what you'll find is once you kind of let the ads run for a while and they start gathering impressions, there will always be one winning ad and there will always be a losing ad once it's sort of statistically viable. And that way, once you find a ad that's not performing as well as as the other ad, you can stop the underperforming ad and create a new split, split test. So you're constantly improving the click-through rate of your ads, but importantly, understanding your market and the messaging that resonates with your market. Right. So at any one time, we'd have to assume that one of the ads will be better than the other one. 100%. Yep. So there's never any time where you shouldn't have an ad comparing to the first one to see which one's better. Exactly. You you should always be split testing your ads, be it search ads or display ads or remarketing ads. You always should be running the split tests all the time. Now, because we're running conversion tracking, we know which ad performs better, right? Exactly. Now, what about someone saying, oh, Alana, I've got an ad that's working so well. I don't want to risk sending half my traffic to an unknown quantity. There's options there, isn't there? Yeah, so you can decide that you can that you might not want to send half the traffic there or you can run it for a finite period of time. So yeah, you don't have to split it evenly. It, you can you can say I don't I don't want to do that, but I would urge people to to split test evenly because personally, I am amazed at some results that come through and and the numbers don't lie. Well, they can lie temporarily, but you have to go to a statistical significant number, right? Yes, so I personally like to wait till each ad has had about 30 clicks each. I was going to say 30 actions is a good little starting benchmark. 
Yeah, nice. <laughs> and if you're running a first-time ad, you're probably going to need at least 300 clicks to find out if you even have a, a 1% conversion because you, you might get one conversion in 100. Mm. Um, if it's a really bad offer, it might be one in 300, like 0.3%. If it's a really good offer, you might only need 30 or 40 clicks till you start making a conversion. So there are certain minimum thresholds that you'll have to run an ad for. And there are tools also that you can go and plug in your stats that will tell you if it's statistically significant or not. Yeah, it's true. I, I personally don't use them, but I know people that do. So you could totally do that as well. Yeah. So 30 actions is a good starting point. Yeah, I, I generally go by that. And you get a bit of a sense of kind of what messaging is resonating with people and then you can, you know, for example, I like to test one thing at a time. So I might just be testing a headline at the one time. So the same ad but just a different headline. Once I know the winning headline, right, I apply that and then I change my ad and I might test a different description line one, for example. And so just be really structured about it because if you kind of test all these different things all at once, you don't really know what's working. So you want to just be very stepwise about it. Right. And when you're starting out, sometimes it's a good idea to have quite different ads just to see which one gets you closer to the mark quickly. Yeah. And I like to test wildly different display ads, especially remarketing ads. Like I'm a big believer in good design and I like to test wildly different design and maybe some complete black and white images versus color versus all this kind of stuff. So I find from a display perspective, the different wildly different designs works really well. When you're starting an account for someone and you're going to do display advertising, wh- how many artworks do you require from them to start with? Well, often people, especially if they're doing it themselves or whatever, they're constrained by budget. So the best way I like to start is I just test one ad unit size and that's 300 by 250 yep. with six different designs. And I like just scattergun, let's get the designs out there. And by testing the one ad unit size, you're removing the variable of of ad unit size being a factor of what's worked and what hasn't. And once I find those the top two designs from from my six in the one ad unit size, I then roll out those two designs in the different ad unit sizes. Perfect. And you found that size is a good size to start with? Well, the 300 by 250 has a lot of available ad placements and you'll get heaps of impressions with that ad unit size. Perfect. So let's finish this up. Alana, what is the number 10 classic AdWords mistake that you've seen? So, you know, in in today's world, we're such a mobile world and I think that people really need to pay attention to how mobile is working for them and and to basically analyse the mobile traffic that they're getting and work out is it worth applying mobile traffic in their AdWords. Like, for example, let's say they look in their Google Analytics and they think mobile traffic does not work really well, then it's worth turning off mobile in, in AdWords because you don't want to be spending all this money on AdWords traffic with the, on a mobile if it doesn't convert very well. Or maybe mobile converts really, really well and you want to increase your bids for mobile, then that's AdWords is a perfect place to do that. So I'd say it's, it, the number 10 is like focusing on mobile to work out how you have to adjust your bids for that mobile traffic. Right. Do you ever tune the website in coordination with that? Yeah, and maybe we create a mobile-specific campaign with a mobile-specific landing page, but that's kind of comes a little bit later for people. I think the best place… That might be the second episode. If, if, <laughs> if you've enjoyed this episode and you want to find out more… Uh, the more advanced stuff and frankly Alana knows a lot more advanced stuff but I've insisted we start with the basic stuff because I'm sure it would be rare that someone's been able to tick every one of these 10 mistakes and if if you've been able to adjust just one or two of these mistakes as a result of listening to this podcast you're going to save a fortune in AdWords budget and you can reinvest that to get a better result so come back and leave comments on this episode, it's called 10 Classic AdWords Mistakes and How to Fix Them. I've been speaking with Ilana from greenarrowdigital.com and we have more information available. If you want more, just let us know so that we can put together another podcast episode for you. Ilana, any, any comments you've got to round out this episode? No, I think we pretty much covered all the um, the 10 mistakes that I see so many people make. So please, I urge you to go through your account and have a 
look at each of these mistakes that we've covered and rectify them because, you know, over time, AdWords is not set and forget and the wasted ad spend can add up and, and frankly, Google don't need any more money than they already have, in my opinion. So you want to make the money you do spend with them go as far as possible. Right. And if you've had your AdWords managed by someone and you found that, that any of these 10 haven't been addressed, I encourage you to get a hold of Alana and have a talk to her about taking over your AdWords management because she obviously knows what she's doing. Ilana, thank you for joining us and sharing these valuable tips. Thank you for having me, James. It's great to be here. Well, I'll speak to you soon. All right. Take care. Discover how to build your business super fast. Check out superfastbusiness.com. Thank you.